everyone. Thanks for joining us on another episode of The Catholic Gentleman. I am so blessed that you have decided to join us. I have a great man and a filmmaker, producer, writer who's joining us today on this show to talk about one of my favorite saints, Saint Maximilian Kolbe. He is somebody that's been close to my heart and with me for really the last 12, 14 years of my life, somewhere around there, so much so that my second son is named after Stephen, the first martyr, and Maximilian Kolbe, uh, a great martyr as well. So um, I'm just so blessed to be joined by Anthony D'Ambrosio today. Like I said, I think I called him a producer, but I guess he's more of a director and writer. You mm-hmm. can clarify all that, Anthony. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well, and uh, I'm super grateful to be on this podcast. I've been like, you know, following it for a long time, and uh, and looking for my opportunity to get on it. So this is uh, an honor. <laughs> well, you, yeah, I, I appreciate that very much. And I tell you what, this is such a great opportunity because I was blessed to be able to go to that um, uh, pre- kind of pre-screening, kind of like you know, mm-hmm. uh, a thank you uh, session on Friday night, and I was overwhelmed by the work that. That you're doing and the the creativity that you are bringing to it, and I did. I found this this beautiful connection between how Saint Maximilian Colby evangelized and what you're doing, right? Because mm. he was so creative. It wasn't just become an apologi- apologetic or apologist and and you know create YouTube. Well, maybe create YouTube videos. You know, maybe <laughs> he would have done that back then. But there was this real heart of creativity and how he was evangelizing, how he's hunting after souls. And I see you're doing the same thing. Yeah, I feel like one of the things that's so interesting about Colby is that um, he he really was the first saint that uh, to embrace modern media and to uh, be thinking uh, forwardly about cinema and its use for evangelization. And before anybody else was thinking about the use of movies, he was already starting to get get the idea for putting together like a film studio, you know? Mm. Uh, so this guy was somebody who had a lot of ambition for how to um, bring the gospel to the world. And of course, the, the, um, the really beautiful paradox of his life is that even though he made a... Um, a one of the biggest publications in Poland at the time that he really is known in his legacy for a very small act of, of love um, that was heroic and that was self-sacrificial and that was really portraying the heart of the gospel just in his own action. So I think that's a really beautiful thing to kind of kick it off with is um, regardless of the creativity, the, the action um, of the Christian is like the most important <clears throat> Thanks be to God, Anthony. I really appreciate that. And yeah, you're right, because Maximilian Kolbe is known for for the end of his life, um, but not necessarily all of the phenomenal work that he did uh, between, and I'll say, yeah, the Catholic Gentleman Plus, we we don't require, but it is the strong suggestion that everybody takes the Maximilian Kolbe Marian Consecration Prayer before they Mm -hmm. dive into all the stuff we're doing over there. And I'll say that he elevated my understanding of, of Mother Mary, of the Immaculata, you know, turning from the Saint Louis de Montfort, where it was a slave to Mary, to now Honestly, Maximum Colby up in at a level where I'm just an instrument to Mm -hmm. have Mary's, you know, an instrument of her grace. And all of that in between was just so powerful. I get his daily emails, well, the uh, Militia Immaculata's daily emails with quotes from him, and and they just edify me every day. So I I just am am so grateful. And actually, with that, tell us a little bit about your relationship with this this phenomenal saint and and your life and and how that all all came to be and how you learned to fall in love with him before we go on to this incredible movie that you're working on. Yeah, thank you. I I I guess I'll start with saying that as a young man who was um grew up in the church, I had certainly been familiar with his story and um at least in a tertiary way like the pictures of him and I actually had a sort of a, a bad taste in my mouth. I really didn't oh. like um, like him, I wasn't attracted to him partly because of sort of the austerity of the photos. Like he just mm. always looks stern at the camera, you know, and um, and also just some of the militant language that I had I had read from him just didn't resonate with me as uh, more of like a Saint Francis type follower that's mm. like you know into the brother son sister moon kind of thing. And um, I really was um, it, it it didn't click to me until. Later in my life, I had a, after I went to seminary, I had a, um, a health crisis that really, um, 
kind of brought me to my knees and I, it caused me to uh, lose the relationship that I thought I, uh, the woman that I thought I was going to get married to and um, the, a lot of the future that I had planned for myself. Um, it caused really extreme in, insomnia, which meant that I, I just couldn't function like a normal person for a very long time. Um, and so I didn't know when that would end, if it ever would. And mm -hmm. I was really uh, angry with God and very uh, jaded, I guess, about like the, the Christian life. It felt to me like, um, at least in, in the way that I had thought about it before, it was like, if you follow God and you are doing his commandments and you're um, you're in good grace and you're, um, you know, discerning well and you seek the vocation that God is calling you, then ultimately, like, you will be given that vocation. You'll be given the good things that God wants you to have. Um, mm -hmm. If he wants us to have joy and life at, life at the fullest, then he'll give those things to us, right? And right. Um, my experience was that that wasn't the case, you know? <laughs> um, and I, I was given um, what felt like a very meaningless cross that just kind of took me off the rails from a, uh, a life that I thought was going to be effective for, for the Lord and for the gospel. And instead I was just sort of bedridden without mm -hmm. any real like thing that I could do with that. And um, if I could, mm -hmm. how long ago was that? What, what are we talking about time frame? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This was about 2014, um, okay, yeah. 2013, 14. Um, and so I was in that place of, um, of anger and God, um, in in sort of a funny way, I feel like he used the the that liminal space between wake and sleep that insomniacs dwell in um, to start bringing me into these meditations about Saint Maximilian Kolbe, and um, I don't know exactly where they came from, but uh, the sense of being in a cell, like being in a prison cell and starving to death, was something that I really related to, and the question wow. that I feel like. Um, was being presented to these men in Auschwitz. Frankly, the, the question of suicide was presented to them the second that they got in. I think the Nazis really wanted to and almost like relished in breaking the human spirit. And so for them, they wanted to see these people like end their own lives. Um, it was almost like a game to them. And so um, for the people who were in the cell, that would have been in some ways, the norm. They were expected to live maybe two days tops. Wow. Um, and there were all sorts of horrible stories um, from people who cleared out other, you know, um, other cells that were punished with the same punishment of cannibalism and of, mm. um, of suicide. So uh, for Colby to be in the cell with these other men where that would have been the, the norm and for him to get them to stay alive for 14 days, not all of them lived that long, but some of them made it all the way with him and were executed with him, um, is quite frankly a miracle. And I think that I felt like there was something there for me to learn. Like whatever he was doing, he gave them meaning and gave them a reason to live in the midst of something that, that where they already knew they were condemned to die. There was no mm. like happy ending that they had to live for, but somehow they still had hope and Colby was able to give that to them. And so as I was meditating on his conversations with, with these men, um, in some way I was kind of like having conversations with him myself. And it felt like to me that he was stepping into my cell because he could understand the suffering that I was going through and was able to help pull me out of that um, and into hope. Oh, glory, praise, praise be to God! Wow, <laughs> Anthony, every time, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm moved uh, by your story, and I really appreciate you sharing that. So, uh, for those of uh, the, uh, our listeners here who are diving in who don't really know the story of Saint Maximilian Kolbe, I'd love for you to share just the kind of your a general understanding as long as you want to about who this great saint was a modern saint of our times and a saint that as you already mentioned you know uh projected heroism you know he projected obviously he showed us the devotional life i've mentioned his love for our lady you have also brought up love you know just in in general and obviously hope um that i know we'll get to or i hope we'll, we will get to no pun intended. <laughs> Why don't you share a little bit about the life of, of St. Maximilian? Yeah, so uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe was born into a small, um, into a, a family that was like radically Catholic. 
uh, Polish family that lived in a, in a small town um, and that uh, was really modest in terms of like their, their material possessions, but a very strong family. Um, and he grew up in a very small, if you've ever seen a Polish country home, the cottage, they're, they're basically one hallway with two rooms. Uh, one of those rooms is the kitchen. One is the bath is the bedroom. But frankly, when you have f- four children and two adults, you have six mm-hmm. people kind of in that, um, that space. He lived in a very kind of modest, very communal life that was very like interdependent. And, um, around him was this incredible tapestry of, of traditions that, uh, are, are just absolutely gorgeous. Um, he often made pilgrimages to Our Lady of Czestochowa, which is mm. basically the Polish Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, and it's my favorite depiction of Mary because she's this, uh, this, this very like somber kind of like almost grieving face that has been battle scarred literally, um, by, uh, people who've constantly, uh, tried to overtake Poland and, um, convert it to a different religion. So, uh, she, this icon was literally slashed. It was shot with arrows, mm. um, tried to be burned. And so all of those scars are still present even in the art, um, of Our Lady of Czestochowa. So, um, he was connected to this tradition of, a uh, Polish grit that was fighting for its Catholic identity. And that was deeply patriotically instilled in him. And in Poland, you kind of have to understand that like the Polish national identity and the Catholic identity are um, identical. There is not a separation between them, at least not historically. Um, And so uh, for him, he was a son of Poland and a sort of a militant kind of fighter for Poland in the same way that he was a fighter for the Immaculata. She was sort of a symbol of the Polish identity and um, really the queen of Poland. And so um, he was, he grew up in this kind of stew of, of Catholicism while at the same time, um, modern technology and modern culture is starting to come in and really shift, um, the, the political and the religious identity of Poland. And he's getting to see, um, Freemasonry and, uh, fascism to the East, uh, or sorry, to the West in Germany and mm-hmm. communism to the East in Russia, all growing in a way that's really terrifying to, I think, most of the people in Poland, but certainly to uh, those people of faith who really wanted to maintain the Polish identity. <clears throat> and he was very much used to kind of the, the legends and tales of and the history of Germany and Russia both invading. And so he grew up um, while Poland was trying to free itself from Russia um, he went to seminary and um, his brother uh, went to like went to fight in that war and his father was killed um, going looking for his brother while his brother was missing. Uh, so he was very familiar with oppression and with having to stand up for one's faith and for one's identity. Um, and that really drove him. Um, and he was he became a, a Franciscan friar. Um, and for him, the battle really was, um, a battle for Catholicism and for the Catholic identity and heart of Poland. And to that end, he made the Militia Immaculata, which was a, um, perhaps the biggest magazine in Poland at the time. Um, did it with no money and no, uh, no experience as a printer. Um, he was able to put together, uh, one of the biggest friaries in the world, um, from nothing and, uh, one of the most um, incredible magazine productions that was ever made. They had a, a million dollar or a million person subscriber base with a daily publication, mm. uh, which just the logistics of that are kind yes, of mind boggling. It is. And um, as a creative, he actually had to him and his, his friars actually had to improve upon, upon the current printing press technology in order to continue doing what they dreamed of doing. So they were not just like, uh, people who were writing articles, like these were people who had 
uh, a, a, an amazing ability to think creatively, to solve problems, to engineer is, issues, to build like the logistics around what they had to do to, to make a publication of that size. They even went to Japan and expanded there in one year, led by Colby. Um, they were able to translate what they were doing into Japanese and, and make it a publication. He learned the language too, right? Yeah. I, I uh, can't even imagine. If you've ever seen <laughs> Polish written down, like yeah. the amount of consonants, to try and translate Polish, which is one of the hardest languages in the world, to Japanese, which is another one of the hardest languages in the world, I cannot imagine. Mm. They did it in, in less than one year without Google Translate, which is just crazy. <laughs> without, um, it was a genius. Yeah, just a genius. Yeah. So, um, of course, but his story comes to a, a, a really intense end as he's offered um, the, the Germans come in, steamroll through Poland with the Blitzkrieg and uh, basically take over. Um, and he, because his dad was German, he's offered ge cit uh, German citizenship, right. um, which is a, uh, a moment that I think he knows if he receives it, he gets to stay and he's probably going to be treated well. But um, in some way, he's he's rejecting the core of him, which is the Polish identity that he's kind of fought for his whole life. So he says no and uh, waits for the visit from the SS, which which certainly happens. They bring him to Auschwitz um, with all of the other political prisoners, POWs um, and anyone who's ideologically uh, of of in conflict with the fascists, but who is also of influence in Poland, is brought to Auschwitz for um, not just for extermination, but for the breaking of their spirits. Yeah, and just a Colby, minute. Oh, I sorry. want to. No, no, I love it. I love everything you're talking about. I want to take a moment and just step back and say and and just reemphasize to our listeners that. His, uh, correct me, right, um, if I'm wrong, his father was German and his mother was Polish. And so mm -hmm. he could have avoided all of this, but because of his national identity, but also because of his love for truth and his love for um, his people, he, he stayed the course and he didn't. I mean, that is also mind-boggling because he wasn't ignorant to what the Germans, the Nazis were doing at the time. And and I could imagine many a good man under fear and worries not choosing that road. So I just want to pause and get more of your thoughts regarding that before we dive into his time at Auschwitz there. I think it's one of the most interesting parts of his life because it's Frankly, it's one of the parts of his life that I relate with the most. I feel like now in our culture, especially men, are being offered a similar devil's bargain all the time. Amen. Like you're, it's not like, hey, we're asking you to reject your faith, to publicly denounce your faith and say God is evil or like God doesn't exist. We're just asking you to go along to get along, like just be part of our team, you know? And I know you don't agree with us. We're not even asking you to like publicly say that you agree with us. We're just asking you to say that you're on our team. Mm -hmm. And that's like such a easy, it seems like such an easy thing to go along with, especially when you're thinking about all the good work that he could keep doing. He could, I mean, he was already taking care of 2000 Jewish refugees. He was, yeah. um, he was doing all sorts of things for the town to just help like rebuild it and keep the, the Polish spirit alive. Like there was so much good that he could do for the Polish underground if he had stayed alive, but he didn't do it. He, he didn't take the deal. And, um, I think that's a really amazing thing to consider for us men who are, um, out in the world doing jobs that are getting more and more woke that are requiring more and more sort of, um, I guess, ascension to, yes. uh, ideologies that are, are counter to Catholicism. Um, they rarely ask for something that's like, I want you to betray your conscience by doing this pagan thing. It's not like they're asking you to eat pork right. as a Jew. They're just asking you to like, keep quiet and, yep. mm. and keep your head down and just be like anyone else. And that temptation right now, I think is the, the most profound temptation that we as men are going to be facing in the next 10 years. I um, it's just agree. more and more of that. 
Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. And I just want to uh, jump in and say that in in total agreement, I think that that is what we have been almost indoctrinated into in our in our societies. Like it didn't happen overnight, very socialist, right, in this sort of approach is that it, it wasn't something that uh, just we woke up one day and, yeah, this woke agenda, you know, overnight happened to us. No, it's something that steadily has happened over the last, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. And... And it's just become almost a part and we've all experienced it in our immaturity, maybe in high school or in college where we tried to talk about being Catholic and then we experienced the uncomfortability of maybe not having the answers or, you know, offending somebody unintentionally or these sort of things. And then that has just built up in our society. And then you you throw mass media at it, right, where um, everything that is um, the control of, you know, one we'll just say the woke agenda on mass media today. And that's not where I plan on taking this episode, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's so um, overwhelming. And so the stuff that's being shown to you and the stuff that you're being digested, you know, is, is just truly slowly indoctrinating. you. And it's something that we have to kind of turn to the silence with God more than the silence, you know, with our neighbor in these situations, if that makes any sense. So I really appreciate mm-hmm. you bringing that up. Yeah, I mean, I I'll share a personal story really Please. quick if that makes sense. That's like relevant to it. I am um, an example from my own life of like where this this kind of thing materialized during the pandemic. Um, my agency, I'm a business owner and run a marketing firm, and um, my agency at the time we had 11 people in it, and um, before the pandemic, it was sort of on this, you know, course up. So we'd hired people and um, these are people who had moved and who had kids. And it was like a lot to try and take care of them as like, you know, the economy just sort of fell out from under us. And we got a, a an opportunity to bid on a big commercial project that was a um, like for a big AI um, construction oh. sort of technology thing um, developed in Silicon Valley, but was like based in Austin, Texas. And um, there was a Catholic girl who was running the the, um, the marketing for it. And she saw some of our work and was like, you know, why don't you guys put in a bid? Um, and we knew that if we got this bid, it was like, this was the game changer that would keep us, keep our team together mm. for the rest of the, of the year. And um, it was a really like exciting opportunity for us. So we went all out with the, the bidding process, like did um, multiple versions of scripts before they'd even, even um, committed to us and like contributed to a much higher level than an agency normally does before they're actually under contract. Um, and sure enough, like we won the bid, she called us and we all like toasted with champagne. We're all like very excited together. Um, and she was like, we just have to pass it through legal. Um, and then crickets, uh, for like a week. And we are like, Oh, Uh -oh. something must've happened with legal. Mm. And, um, she called me and let me know like what went down. And she was like, Hey, the good news is like, we were able to work something out to like continue working with you. The bad news is like, I have some sort of like awkward news for you. And I was like, okay, what is it? And she said, well, they looked at uh, legal, like did some research on you guys and they looked at your portfolio and they saw that there was some, uh, some clientele on there that they didn't feel like had messages that they could really agree with. And they were afraid of some sort of um, like PR crisis if it got out that their film, um, that their commercial was like made by people who like disagreed with you know, that, that had these controversial opinions. And so we are able to work together, but under the caveat that you guys can't say that you made it and you can't put it on your website and it gets credited as an internal project done by our marketing team. And we were like, you know, this is a really interesting juncture because we stay alive if we wow. stay with it, but there's a way that it feels like we're, you know, silencing ourselves because we're Catholic. Like we know that what they saw was other Catholic, you know, things on there. They saw like, a, probably saw something for a pro-life, you know, clinic 
um, that was sure. uh, the, a crisis pregnancy center or something and, and got really spooked. And so we decided not to take the project, wow. um, to turn it down and ultimately to disband the team because we knew that like we wouldn't have anything to, to um, come in that could, could keep us make, making payroll. And what's really interesting about that is that that actually was when I started working on the feature length script wow. because everything quieted down. And I was like, there's no, there's no business. Um, I need to be reflecting on something that's, that's beautiful. That gives me hope. And I was drawn to picking the script back up. So it's wow. kind of an interesting, like, you know, connection to the story. Anthony, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. You know, in the scripture, what does it profit a man to gain the world, but to lose his soul, you know, really cuts deep right there. And, and I think what a what a tough discernment that you had to make to go between yeah feeding and doing families and and you know continuing your business uh versus yeah kind of maybe violating your conscience as you were saying and i think um yeah what a heroic move on your part and so then you're kind of in this i i guess let me ask you here are you in this situation of kind of like despair hopelessness is there um any that far or is it more just you know disillusionment uh, depression you know now you've got this this silence upon you and and you decide to write start writing about saint maximilian i think this is a, a perfect segue into the beautiful and incredible project you're working on yeah so there's sort of two different phases of of the project there was kind of like the initial idea back in 2014 when i was at that time, I was in complete despair. Like mm. uh, I was a professed agnostic um, mm. during that season of my life, um, and I was I was more like, but more intense. I was kind of like I had more of that bitterness of the atheist going on. Sure. But um, I, when I started to meditate on this story of Maximilian Kolbe, I began to have this like openness in my heart. Not even necessarily to like saying that that God is good or that God exists, but just to having this like openness to the, the person of Christ, um, who is willing to be with me in my suffering. It was like, mm. that's somebody that I can follow and understand, even if I don't understand how, like, you know, what this whole divinity, you know, supernatural thing is here. And, um, I, that led slowly to a reclaiming of my faith that happened over many years. Um, but during that time of reclaiming, one of the high watermarks was being asked by the Diocese of Dallas to help them reach people who had left the church okay. with an event. And um, in collaboration, we came up with this idea to do a short film about St. Maximilian Kolbe, which became um, kind of the proof of concept for this film that we're making right now. And that was done back in 2018. So um, fast forward to the pandemic when the company goes belly up, um, it, I wouldn't say that I was in despair. I think it already hit like the bottom in a yeah, way you'd experience back that. in 2014. Yeah. But at this time it was a different kind of like, um, perhaps a despairing in the world or a, mm. like, how do I, how do I show up as a Christian when I see the world going in a direction that I feel like is ultimately going to like chew me up and spit me out, Amen. you know? And I, I think that Colby became my like my example for how to navigate what felt like to me was like an Armageddon for like the Catholic world. Um, and uh, yeah, that that meditation led to writing the feature length script, going to Poland and living with the friars out there to understand him more deeply. And then ultimately to um, to starting to pitch it to investors and um, raising the money to go and shoot it. Yeah, praise God. Well, and I appreciate you following through with that that thread of of inspiration, that thread of hope, and obviously creativity. So, have you been? Were you a writer prior to this, or is this uh, you know the first screen you know writing that you had ever done? Where where does that kind of fall within the line of of your life? Yeah, so I I've been a writer all my life. Um, okay. I studied. Um, creative writing even when I was in college, but I hadn't done a feature length script yet. Um, and I had the opportunity to join a group of Hollywood writers who were all doing, you know, secular projects, um, but who really understood the process of screenwriting. Um, it was kind of a divinely inspired thing. I'm not sure how I ended up in the room because I was like <laughs> so, so beneath the league of these other uh, filmmakers. 
And frankly, it was like deeply embarrassing showing them things that I was working on. <laughs> but um, I stuck with it and um, we got to do a couple of, of table readings of the, of the um, feature length script of the Colby film uh, with them. And it was just really clear based on uh, how everybody was reacting in in those table readings that there was something really powerful here that we should follow and chase down. Very cool. Yeah, well, and I want to hear about that now. So now we're entering into the life of of Auschwitz um, and St. Maximilian Kolbe. And I'll start by, I don't have the quote memorized, but uh, I know that an individual there who made it out alive stated that within just a couple weeks of getting to know St. Maximilian Kolbe, he went from, you know, this this fear of whether he's ever going to see his family and this total despair to almost an excitement and a joy at the thought of dying uh, along with Christ and sacrificing along with Christ for the sake of the world and the sake of these conversions and stuff. And I mean, it's just, it's that level. It's almost, it's, it, it sounds, uh, almost like a fantasy or something, you know, or something very fictional that, that there's a man that was, that lived the devotional life so deeply that when he entered into this darkest of, of, you know, hell on earth, he was able to still breathe God's light and love into that place and hope um, into that place. So I'd love for you to talk about his time there at Auschwitz, but also kind of the unique inspiration for your your film and the direction that you decided to take. Because while I appreciate that and I want to hear that, I'll also add in agreement with you that there's a lot of crappy you know, movies out there that aren't doing a great job of of bettering the mission of the church. And I'll say that what I've seen of yours is not at all the case. And so um, I'm grateful for that. But I'd love for you to kind of talk about all those things. For sure. Yeah. So we kind of left off on Colby's story as he was brought to Auschwitz. Um, he had a, um, as you said, he had a really profound effect on the people that he was around because this is a man who's been prepared for this in a lot of ways his whole life. He's lived in incredibly close communal situations um, under duress, under crazy stress and, and work pressure um, and fasting the whole time, you know. Um, so Auschwitz in some ways is like, it, aside from the oppressive people that are trying to break your spirit, like mm. um, the actual living situation is not that out of the norm for what he's lived. Um, and so he's able to offer this like hope and this kind of endurance uh, to the people around him who are themselves like caving under the pressures and beginning to steal from each other or to like throw themselves on the electric fence or yeah. all the sorts of things that the, the Nazis were trying to do to show them that their human, their humanity was, was, um, was not real, um, was a, a fiction. And so Colby, um, began in some way through just his example, this kind of game of chicken with the, the Nazis where he is, by continuing to be noble and to retain his nobility and his humanity, um, being like this kind of uh, this rock and pebble in the shoe of the Nazis, like they can't break his spirit. And ultimately that crescendos into this moment where um, when the Nazis are, whenever somebody leaves or it goes missing, um, they would bring all of the people from that, that bunkhouse um, or that prison block to um, a roll call where they would select 10 people at random to die of starvation um, while they were looking for this person. And if they found the person, then the people would be um, released. Mm -hmm. But if they didn't find the person, then they would all die. But of course, most of the time they all died, even if they did find the person because they all died so quickly. Yeah. Um, and so um, Colby volunteers to take the place of one of the men who cries out and says, I have a wife and children, please, you know, please let me go. Um, Colby saves that man's life by volunteering to take his place. Um, the Nazis miraculously allow him to do it, allow him to step out of line without shooting him, which is its own, yeah. um, like weird, weird, never ever happened before or after in Auschwitz. Um, and, uh, then from inside of the cell, 
he leads almost like what we've seen in these movies like hunger or whatever, like about, you know, starvation strikes. Yeah. Um, it's, it's sort of like that where these men are become this, um, they are beginning to pray. They become this sort of like place of revival in the midst of the torture chamber in Auschwitz, literally the darkest place in the darkest place on earth. These people are singing songs, praying and leading the other people in the cells around them in um, a revival of their Catholic identity. And of course, their songs begin to like resonate out outside of the prison block um, through these windows. And the other people passing by hear that and realize and, and kind of return to themselves. Like it wakes their own dignity back up to see other people suffering that way. And ultimately, um, they were given, they were able to stay alive for 14 days um, until the Nazis had enough of it and decided to execute them with carbolic acid. Um, and Colby died the day before um, the Assumption of Mary, um, his, his, uh, the feast day of, of the, the uh, Immaculate. So I think it's just really beautiful that um, he kind of was able to go and meet her and in some ways be brought up to heaven uh, on mm -hmm. the feast day in which she was brought up to heaven. So Truly, um, without yeah. God's grace, it, it would not be possible. It is absolutely a testament of God's working through the life of an individual, which each of us are called um, to experience, but that his life, you know, prepared him for that and that he was able to. And I love that story that you were talking about where there was, there was these chants and there was these prayers. And I know that the janitor who made it out, uh, thanks be to God, um, also a miracle, uh, was able to see anytime the door opened, right, that Maximum Kolb was in the center there on his knees or standing, you know, and just leading these people. And I remember him saying it was almost as if he was in church because mm -hmm. of that. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's mind boggling as well. But I really, Really want to talk about your movie here and so share with me uh your movie let's talk about uh the triumph of the heart right uh that uh, that you are putting forth and 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 in the struggle that it was to bring that into existence <laughs> i i just want to i want you to be able to share it all yeah so we um after i began to after we did that short film the idea of the short film was um instead of taking on Colby's life from like beginning to end and trying to do the whole thing, which most Saint films, um, unfortunately flounder, I think for a lot right. of reasons, but okay. one of them is that like, they're trying to tell like the whole history of a person's life. And it's just, um, every life has so many stories inside of it that, that tends to kind of water down all of them. Yeah. Um, so what we did was we were like, let's just tell his passion from the last from the moment that he steps out of line all the way through um, his death, how does he engage with these other men in this cell to bring them to that place of hope, knowing that these are people who have off, probably have very different ideologies than him, um, who have been brought to this kind of like the the their humanity has been removed from them by the brutality of Auschwitz. Um, how does he bring them to hope and bring them to this place of being able to fight to stay alive? So we did a sort of, if 12 angry men meets the passion of the Christ, yeah. what would that look like? Like wow. it's one room where a saint is trying to, to hold out for life and for hope um, while these other people are in question about whether or not they should, you know, commit suicide or not. And um, that is the... Um, it's kind of like the 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 place that we go to, and of course, it's very dark. But um, the way that the film progresses, you see these characters begin to um, come on board with Colby and to open up their hearts to him, and slowly um, a brotherhood develops in the cell as one by one, each one of them uh, kind of has their moment of conversion and comes alongside of him and begins to like join his his little militia in the cell to sing to those outside of it and to pray for the people in the cell um and or sorry in Auschwitz and so um that that story along with the flashbacks to their lives and how um how this moment kind of begins to 
make sense of, of all of that, or at least to, to redeem it. Uh, that's really the, the story that we're telling and the lens through which we're looking at Colby's story. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. I, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing the full movie. I think it is so well done. And I guess that's it. I, I don't want to just use artistic and, and to the point where it's, it's not going to captivate all that you have so eloquently uh, laid before us because I do in my brief experiences, you know, 18 minutes here, five minutes there, you know, et cetera, uh, just really gain that sense of of beauty and wonder and, and awe at, at who he is and not like, again, hopelessness, right? Because when you think about watching a whole movie in the cell, um, I know that you you did a um, you know there's the flashbacks and the you know memories of of their past and everything like that, but um, not to experience um, you know that sort of like darkness and be able to thread that very difficult needle takes a certain degree of of grace and and talent. So <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I I don't know you know it's it's still like the jury's still out right like. <sighs> I think that it's still going to be really hard to watch. There's no way around sure. the fact that like we have to take you on this kind of descent into hell yeah. in order for you to understand the heroism um that Colby, you know, displayed. And um the question like we are playing with 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 gloves for sure. Like we yeah. nerf down the difficulty of the story tremendously, but it's still going to be difficult to watch as perhaps the passion of the Christ was, but this is different in that it's kind of like more psychologically brutal. Mm. Um, and I think that's a, there's a different kind of perhaps even more relatable suffering, um, that's going on there than like the torture of the crucifixion. So, um, certainly don't bring kids that are younger than like 13 to watch it when it comes out, because it is certainly like kind of adult topics, but Yeah. yeah. Ah, uh, I want to, so real quick. I would love to hear too, you know, yeah. I didn't get to talk to you after the event. You got to see the first six yeah. minutes of the film. Like, what were your thoughts? Obviously, you say, you feel like, wow, this is auth- uh, um, authentic. It's like, you know, artistic. But yeah, what, I'm what happy. did you feel? Yeah, I appreciate that question. And I'm happy to share with you. So I'm skeptical anytime I come to one of these uh, <laughs> events or see one of these movies. I'm just, you know, I am who I am. I pray about that. And I'm looking to be more charitable and more loving. <laughs> so, but I think that sets the stage, right? I was expecting to um, not be moved. I was expecting to see something that was a, a good, uh, good attempt you know, and mm-hmm. I, I mean, it is who I am. I am jaded. I think our <laughs> listeners know that uh, it is all the stuff that I work through and I'm honest about, but that was it, you know, and I was glad to see, you know, a bunch of friends and see you and, um, you know, and, and, and be there. But um, I don't want to say that it was the people that were there as much as it was the delivery of the message and the way that you guys were not only authentic, but, but the, um, the story that you're telling. And I, and I mean that like, it's very unique. And I, 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 again, I don't want to take away from it. I only want to add to it because I wasn't expecting to see kind of the flashbacks. I wasn't expecting to, to not only see, um, uh, my favorite saint, St. Maximin Colby, but also as you intended to do the life of the nine other prisoners there and, and truly not just the life of them there, but the life that they had, right? Had that layer of dignity, but that layer of humanity on each of them. And so I was, um, I was very grateful to have, I told Jeff that right afterwards, that I was really grateful to have, um, to have come and to have been a part of that and to experience that and, and truly excited to have you on the show to do what we can here to, to help bring this, um, you know, through Angel Studios. I want to make sure you have time to talk about that. Um, but to more and more people, uh, so that was my, yeah, that was my experience in, in a nutshell. Yeah. Like to, to see these, like these mini flashbacks, even the ones that we had in the first six minutes that kind of humanized the people in the cell. Um, I would say, I guess it, it felt like all of a sudden the stakes of Colby's sacrifice became so much more evident to you. So well stated. Absolutely. That's exactly right. You know, where it wasn't so much, um, uh, 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 um, a saint among men, right? As much as it was, um, just that, that 
that depth of humanity that was given to all of them, right? Because I do think when we read saint stories, we do have this feeling of it's, you know, they were, their lives were unachievable or everybody else was just, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, let's call them, um, what, what's it called in, in computer generated, um, you know, characters in oh, their oh, story. They're like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you're, uh, they're, they're the, um, the, oh crap. I'm forgetting yeah. the name too. <laughs> so you get the gist though. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, not a big gamer myself, but you know, they, yeah, they're like these computer generated, you know, um, uh, characters in, in the story. NPCs. NPCs, they're NPCs. Yes, exactly. In the story of the saint. <laughs> um, but in fact, you know, these were people with real hopes and real dreams and real love and real emotions and, and a real life, you know, and I do, I think that that just brought, uh, this, this unique tapestry, uh, together. That's going to make this, uh, resonate with so many people and also affect them on a level that remains right. I always say a good movie is that what you're going to wake up to the next day thinking about. And, and this has all every, every detail and recipe that they're going to be thinking about it for the next <laughs> few mornings, which is, um, which is, you know, an exciting prospect. So, um, yeah. you know, I know we're 45 minutes in and, and, uh, people are stopping to listen. So I want to make sure that we have time here to, to share, share the story. I mean, you were on your own hero's journey. You shot this in Auschwitz. I mean, that itself is, is miraculous. And, um, but, uh, where can people go to learn more, to help you, to support, and to be aware of, uh, what's at stake, you know, of, of getting this out there far and wide? Yeah, so we, um, I think we're at the beginning of a Catholic Renaissance in film. Mm. I think it's like something that is part of why people are so excited about this film. It's not just us, but um, Cabrini is coming out and um, we got to yeah. see Father Stu come out before. And there's this sense that like there's a new wave of uh, storytelling that um, that we're achieving. and. Yeah. Part of the medium for for that is our ability to crowdfund things. Like we get to say, even though Hollywood is still doing its thing, we can create a whole different economy just by uh, tapping into through the power of social media, um, tapping into our own wallets and doing like $20, yeah. $10, like $15 um, to pre-order a ticket or to say, hey, I just want to see this movie made. Um, that kind of crowdfunding is amazing because it offers the ability to go outside of the industry. Yeah. And so we um, we raised some money beforehand to go and shoot, but it wasn't enough to finish the movie. So now we're in the process of crowdfunding. Hopefully this movie comes out before we're done this week. But if it, if it doesn't, um, you know, people can still sort of follow along with us after that. But the point is right now for people who want to see that Renaissance in Catholic film happen, the main things that we have to do are we have to prove that there's an ecosystem economically viable, an economically viable ecosystem of uh, people that want to see these films made. Uh, I think that when we've been in conversations with other distributors, other than Angel Studios, who's a bit of a distinct cat, which I'll talk about in a second, but yeah. other studios and other people in the industry are like, you'll never be able to be successful with this film. Please don't do it. Uh, people who want to make faith-based movies they want really, you know, like the the God's not dead, fireproof type yeah, story. Kevin it's Sorbo. a happy ending, yeah. <laughs> you know, like everything is is very like it's a palatable movie for somebody who um, wants a good family film at the end of the day. Like yeah. that is that's the market. So like we know that that works. This is not that. Like yeah. you have people starving in a cell. It's like hunger, you know, like it's very intense. That's not like a family based film that they're going to go and watch on a, you know, so it's like point is, I think they they have a box and we have to show for them to be able to put $15 million down for like a, a theatrical release. We have to show them that there's a market for the film and by ordering or doing a crowdfunding campaign, that market is proven and every small gift doesn't matter how big it is. $5, $1, like somebody gave $3, uh, uh, Jeff's daughter gave us $10, yeah, you know, yeah. like every single one of those gifts is a vote for the movie to be made and to be distributed. And so right now we are in conversations with Angel Studios that did Mother Cabrini. And um, this 
crowdfunding campaign is a part of the data that they're collecting to say whether or not they're going to do a theatrical release. So um, it's going to be uh, really helpful if people are able to contribute even small amounts to be able to help this movie uh, come about. Amen. So all of those links are going to be in the show notes. You can click on them. Uh, they're going to take you right over there so that you can help assist um, uh, this this movie get far and wide. Because I, again, and I said what's at stake, and I'm going to just bring that up here. I remember you saying not to just the other night that what's at stake is a uh, thea- theatrical release. You know, we this can get into movie theaters, and Angel Studios could provide the investment, the millions and millions of dollars necessary to do that uh, for God's kingdom, for for the goodness of others, and for hope to be shared uh, to those in need, which is frankly pretty much everybody these days. So, um, yeah. Any last thoughts on on that just to encourage people to head over? Yeah. I think that like the, what people are going to experience when they watch this film is a, an awe, I think of like what these men were able to experience and a sense of hope that God can work even in the most brutal and most difficult of circumstances And I think that Colby's vision of heaven, which is something that he kept to himself his whole life, but that was really clear that he was able to hold on to, that drove him to be able to do these acts of heroism that seem kind of mind-boggling to us. But I think that our own capacity to sacrifice and to all, even to accept our crosses, um, I think those things are going to really be transformed as we get in touch with this story. Amen. Well, Anthony, thank you so very much for doing this. Thank you so very much for your ass. Thanks for joining me on the show today. It means a lot. And I just, um, you're in my prayers. I'm going to call all our listeners to offer up a prayer right now. Click on that link and head over there and, and donate or show ways that you can support, even sharing it out on social media. All of those things are incredibly helpful and it'll mean a lot. And so please do that. Say that, take that yes and, and do that. So mm-hmm. Anthony, again, thank you so very much for joining us today. Thank you so much, John. I'm really grateful to to hear your your own experiences with the watching the first six minutes of the film and and obviously this like platform is just such a gift to be given to um, to be able to share about the story. So I appreciate you having me on, and I'm looking forward to uh, looking forward to showing the full movie to you, man. Awesome. Come Likewise, through. I'm looking forward to seeing it. So again, thank you so very much, and for all of our listeners, you know, for Christ in Heaven, Our Lady in Her uh, Glory, and for this movie in Saint Maximilian Kobli, please keep us all in your prayers. Be a man. Be a saint.